Welcome everyone, welcome back. This is day two of um, three days of just interviewing straight. And I'm here with the awesome Mark Arm of um, what Mud Honey, Green River, and just basically the, the founders of, I would say, the grunge in the 90s movement. And um, the feedback, I call it the feedbacker movement, just like everything rushing to at once, that kind of feeling. So welcome, man. Uh, thank you, nice to be here. Yeah, really nice to meet you. Um, and I just want to say that your fan base is like incredible, like the fan base surrounding Mud Honey and everything. I um I asked a question. I asked what people would want me to ask you, and everyone you know poured their hearts out in their replies and gave these really personal questions, which is really oh. beautiful to see. Like everyone was talking about, oh, my son was there at you know front row at your shows, or it's really nice to see. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the people who come to our shows are awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I'm a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I completely I want to go to one of your shows hopefully someday, but yeah, yeah. The last time we played uh, the Earl, which I think oh, you're yeah. a little young for, right? Yeah, I wanted I want to go to the Earl because there's a couple of shows I want to go to, but I think it's like 18 plus. But yeah, one day, <laughs> one day. Um. What do you think, Steve? What do you? What's your opinion on the current state of music and how everything is right now? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I've never really like what, what. What does that mean? You know, like I've never really paid attention to pop music or you know what's going on on the commercial level. It's always just sort of been irrelevant to me. Um, and at this point, I don't really feel like I have my finger on the pulse of things the same way I did when I was in my twenties or yeah you know much younger and like actively is seeking things out yeah uh i mean things kind of come to me sort of more passively like friends of mine that put out records or whatever mm -hmm. um uh and i have a friend that i work with you know who's like playing new stuff all the time so you know so you're kind of in that local scene then right no uh, more like you know like larry hardy who runs in the records in the red records is an old friend of mine and you know like he'll send me like he sent me the most recent cheater slicks record and um uh uh the skull practitioners record which is when that came out and that just blew me away it's nice to hear that you're still at least you know keeping in touch and you're listening to like good music you know like the um it's really nice to see when people listen to lesser known bands or i hate to say it but just like yeah it's, it sucks that these these kind of bands are lesser known like, do you, do you listen to No Means No? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw them before they had a guitar player. <laughs> Lucky. Um, one of my, um, one of, one of friends now, Chet Sar, who I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, he introduced me to No Means No, and it's been on repeat, you know? Because it's right. crazy how good those kind of punky sort of bands are, which, like, I guess, like, is Mud, Mud Honey kind of is a punk band, right? Are you guys? I think we're a punk band. You know, I mean, that's definitely part of our roots. Mm. And punk is more of like a, a mindset, though, right? Like, would you rather put punk to a sound or to like a, like, I'm, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want? Uh, I mean, I don't know if that's just strictly limited to punk. I mean, there's people in, in jazz and fucking psychedelic music who, I don't know why I swore. No, no. <laughs> or, I mean, like, Genesis are clearly, you know, a band that was at one point doing what they wanted to do that was like not commercial at all and they eventually changed but yeah that's you know. it. and it, it hurts so much because especially a band like genesis where they had so much goddamn potential like i could really see them doing more and more experimental stuff and just really flipping it over i mean of course every band has to go through its cycle and go through its things but i wonder like what would have happened if if steve hackett and um Peter Gabriel stoned the band and they just kept making weird ass music. Yeah, I don't know. I would have loved it. And I mean, um, you know, at one point, like Phil Collins drummed on Brian Eno records. Yeah. I, you know. Speaking of, look at that. Speaking of Brian Eno, this is Cluster and Eno. Oh, right, right. I just picked this up a couple <laughs> of days ago. Beautiful record. Yeah. And uh, speaking of jazz, um, on your Spotify, like they put a, a playlist of your music. And it was, oh. really, it was funny to see because it, it was all jazz and like really good jazz too. Like I saw I saw a Coltrane, I saw a bunch of these really awesome artists. 
So is that kind of where you get your inspiration from? Like, do you listen to mostly jazz? No, I, I do listen to it, but it's not mostly. Um, I mean, like anything, there's really great stuff, like in any genre, even some genres that might not be like super inclined to listen to, but I believe that probably like maybe 10% or less is amazing. And then there's just everything else. <laughs> yeah, it's it, but now I think in, in this day and age where everyone's so creative and so creatively, um, I guess, dialed in, it's nice to see that the the new whenever I'm like I get notifications from Sub Pop or something that there's a new record out and you listen to it, it's like wow, this is really good. We're getting really good music, and I say, I think it is more than ten percent now. You know, like ten percent is like hmm, like I don't know, like Hoover, right? Like Hoover Three, a band that right. opened for you guys. Their new yeah. record is spot on. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. It's great. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, and and Bert's an awesome dude too. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, what up, Bert? If you're seeing this, thank you so much for connecting us. It's awesome. I really, yeah, he is. It, it's so, it's a, you know, it's nice to see when when there's a family in music. Like you get the warm feeling whenever I'm talking to Bert. You know, I'm just like texting him or um, on Instagram when we're talking, and we can have a conversation like normal people. And like he'll give me some music and some inspiration, and then you know, it's just you don't get that anymore. I think. You might. I'm you not on Instagram, so I have no idea. Yeah, I mean that's that's the right way to go, if anything, because it's you know social media can be a, a really screwed up place, but it can also be. That's really what I hear. Place. That's what I hear. <laughs> you never wanted to like try Instagram. Well, uh, my wife is on it, and every once in a while she's show me like a cool, cute pet video. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you know something just goofy but i mean i don't i think when it first started it seemed like all people were posting was their dinners oh yeah yeah my mom my mom's whenever um we're at the down or like on the couch and she'll like be on her phone after dinner and she'll be like showing these pictures of random meals that she wants to make like it's hmm, the the hyper personalization of social media you know like I feel like that's a good thing because I get to find all my obscure music and my mom gets to find all their music. I mean, all of her dinners and your wife gets to find all of her cat videos. But at the same time. Hey, there's dog videos too. And sometimes. Oh, yeah. But, but um, if, if you're too hyper personal, personalized, whatever it is, whenever you're like basically surrounded by yes men, right? I feel like you don't get out into your, into your zone, into finding new things. Like if my mom only looks at Indian food, she's only going to get Indian food like right. on her Instagrams. So that, I mean, that's a good thing because she, she likes Indian food, but that's a bad thing because what if there's some really good ass Chinese spot down the street? Like right. as a crazy metaphor, but that's like the, the way the world is, you know, like if, if you really like Soundgarden, you're only going to get Soundgarden. But wait what if you want to explore what if you're never going to see john coltrane if you're just <laughs> only listening to, to um soundgarden so that's like the my issue with instagram and stuff you know like the the algorithm as they say it's scary well, I mean, the, yeah the algorithm is sort of based on like oh you like this this sounds kind of like this maybe you'll like this instead of just pushing you off in different directions I mean, that's that's a good point too, but I don't know. It's it's also like it's too much to handle, you know. Like when everything's getting pushed at you, you know, you're seeing everything at once. And you're oh, I could imagine it's just getting over, be, becoming overwhelming. Oh yeah, for sure. And everyone's on it, you know. Everyone's on their social media, and everyone's connected to their social media. But and also, then, like, just in terms of just finding music, it's great that you can just find anything right now. Oh, yeah. You know? That's, that's like, the but biggest I thing. I kind of wonder, like, how deeply people sometimes get into things. You know, you can kind of listen to something kind of cursory and go, like, oh, well, that's cool, and kind of, like, move on to the next thing. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the olden days. <laughs> when you had an allowance and you'd have to go buy a record and you could only afford like one record at a time 
And then you'd sit with that record and listen to it over and over again because that was the only record you had. Or, you know, part of like just a couple of records. And you, so you really got to know a record. And maybe sometimes initially it wouldn't even sound that good to you. But with time it would either, or, or sometimes you'd like hear something and it like, this sounds great immediately but then the more you listen to it you go like hey, you know this is kind of weak mm. you know if yeah, you just like, dig into something and then you know like it kind of sorts itself out i think and uh, i mean funnily enough i think i completely agree with that because these are my only two records i have sweet well that's, that's a good start <laughs> <laughs> like uh, there's there's a bunch of corporate record stores where i live you know and it's it's disheartening because I want to support local businesses. So whenever I'm in like Athens, Georgia, shout out to um, Wax Tree Records. That's where I got this from. Like this. Are you in uh, in Athens then? No, I'm I'm near Atlanta, a little bit okay. like forty minutes from Atlanta. But oh, I'm, my grandparents it, used to live in Athens, so I go Decatur? there. Decatur. Is there Wax Tree in Decatur? There is a Wax Tree. Yes, you're right. There's two. There's one in there's one in Decatur and one in um Athens and. Huge shout out to them. Like back to the family thing. They are just a wholesome family. Like I've been in there a couple of times and you can go in and be like, I want to listen to something like Swans. Like that's what I asked them for. I said, I want something like Swans. And they gave me some recommendations and it wasn't my taste. So I got the email. But still, it's just really beautiful to you know try out new music and they're really down to earth people. That's my little right, right. I love them. It, it's helpful to, you know have a guy at a record store whose taste you trust or girl or <laughs> yeah and yeah that too but yeah i love the um the family and uh something i do want to talk about right so you mud honey when i think of mud honey i think of I think of fuzz i think of moss for some reason i think of feedback so how the hell do you how the hell do you get these kind of tones is it just like you guys are sitting down and screwing around with your amps and getting pedals or is it more of a you'll go into a, rec a guitar store and just see something that looks cool and try it out uh no it's more just <laughs> uh, uh making noise with the stuff that we have <laughs> i mean kind of during the pandemic i bought a lot of pedals online which is sort of not normal for me but that was kind of my outlet mm -hmm. uh but i mean they're mostly yeah, of the distortion or fuzz variety, maybe a few uh, delays here and there. Do you think like the pandemic was almost like a creative high for people because you had nothing else to do? So you're just playing guitar or? Well, not for me. I was at work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for like, there, you know, maybe the first six weeks of it or something, I was like, Oh, this is great. I'm going to do really accomplish a lot of stuff. And I just end up like kind of watching TV and then, <laughs> then having to go back to work. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it worked it, at like staggered shifts in the warehouse. So like no one really worked with sending anyone else uh, for a while. Yeah. It's, that, that's a really good perspective because like I was maybe 12, I think. So I, I, I really just didn't do anything. Like I think um I got I I ate a bunch of Doritos. The guys constantly ate chips, and then right. I got a my first guitar. So oh, it's, right. it's mind blowing because I don't think I'd be talking to you. I don't think I'd be talking to um Brent Brent York or Brent. I don't want to say his last name. Brent Bjork. Yeah, Brent Bjork or Caius. Oh right, right. Or like I won't be able to talk to any of these people if I hadn't um if I. I hate to say this, but if I hadn't gotten Smells Like Teen Spirit on YouTube, huh. it's, it's so dumb. Well, that was your gateway. It, for sure, because I saw this weird looking dude and I saw, I think it's like a bunch of cheerleaders on the cover. So I saw right. cheerleaders and I saw a weird name and I saw Smells Like Teen Spirit and I, I ignored it for like the maybe a month and I kept getting it. It's like the algorithm, right? Kept pushing that to me. And I've never listened to rock before that. And I listened to Nirvana. That's really weird. What yeah, were you I listening to before that? Nothing. I didn't listen. No. I barely listened to music. Huh. Oh, I got into some Queen. I, <laughs> my friends loved Queen. But me, I didn't really listen to much music. And if it was, it'd be pop music. 
Right, cause, right. Because I was easily, you know, and then I found Nirvana and I stayed on Nirvana for a month and then I went face first in the sound garden and I found you guys and I found everyone and I found like, I hate like fuzz, fuzzy, like the fuzz. Like I love that. Right, right. enveloped in it. And same thing with your live performances. Do you, do you make it almost like a point to make your performances loud and to feel it like like other um I guess noisy bands. Well, or we don't. You know, we our amps aren't enormous or anything like that. Uh, you know, I like to feel it, but I don't like to drive people away. <laughs> so that's so like a um, point, right? Uh, I think there's a balance in there. And a lot of venues now at this point, they have uh, decibel uh, limits that you have to kind of abide by. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is probably a good thing, you know. I like, don't want anyone coming down. I, I, you know, I, I had to get hearing aids just this last year. Oh, yeah. It's, but it's, I mean, that could have that could have happened just because of how old I am. You know, a lot of people who don't listen to loud music end up with hearing aids. But I mean, is it worth it? Because I think that if you're living life to the fullest extent, like if I'm really listening to all my favorite music, it's worth it. Like I lived, you only have one life. So if I'm really going to all my Mud Honey concerts and I'm enjoying it, it's kind of a price to pay, you know? Yeah, so yeah, but there's a balance. You know, you can wear earplugs yeah. and still enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I remember my, my first concert was Elton John. Uh, huh? And uh, I didn't have any earplugs. Because I didn't think I'd need earplugs, and no one had earplugs, and so the whole time my hands were like on my ears because I, oh, wow. like, I felt it. I felt myself losing um, my hearing, and like I play violin, so my you know how violin players will lose hearing on their ear that's closest. Oh right, right, right. right. Yeah, so I already have. I, I think it's only me because I play violin pretty often, but like only me, my friend group. But I have terrible hearing damage in um, in one of my ears. Oh no. <laughs> Like it's not it's not good yeah they think think, <laughs> think all the people think all my friends who have told me get earbuds and now when i go to my when i, when I go to my concerts i have my earbuds and it sounds great but again like you're very wise with the balance because people you know it's it's gone in an instant um you should uh look for records with simon house who Simon House, he's a violin player from the UK, played yeah. in like Hawkwind for a while, and I think I uh, had a band called High Tide. Write that down. Appreciate it. And then here, I'm going to give you a violin player to listen to. Jean-Luc Ponty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, yeah. amazing. Anyone who doesn't know Jean-Luc Ponty, you're missing out. Uh, it's progressive violin playing. It's beautiful. Um, speaking of, yeah, speaking of violin, have you ever considered doing like an orchestral or like a band forward album? No, <laughs> <laughs> we're just a simple rock band, you know. Well, I'm we're not, gonna, we're not gonna do anything unplugged. We're not gonna uh, add orchestral stuff. I mean, you know, we've done a couple things with horns. Yeah, that's I mean, horns. And, right there. And oh, yeah. there, there was a violin player on uh, 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 since we become translucent on the last song. Oh okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like horns seem like I guess I can imagine like driving sounds and feedback, and then you have like a middle school horn section just going crazy in the background. You know, like really be pushing the emotion. So I, I implore, I implore you guys. Like that would be uh, beautiful. There's, uh, there's a couple of Saints records you might want to check out if you want to listen to horns. Uh, Eternally Yours and Prehistoric Sounds. Uh, it's a really great blend of rock with horns. It's kind of a sort of a soul punk kind of thing, I guess. And then here, I'll give you one to listen to. Um, the lamb as effigy. Okay. Th that's a very um. Eh, crap, I don't remember who made it, but um, it's a really depressing, <laughs> it's a really depressing album, but it's really abstract and it's like pushing. 
but for me it's pushing the barriers of um 3d and 4d music if that makes any sense so check check that out. It's a really good listen. Will do. Beautiful listen. And they're a great record too. Here, so um, you you seem very Melvins esque. Like you seem like you'd be friends with Buzz from the. Are you friends with Buzz from the Melvins? Yeah. Dude, I, what, what do you do? You think we ever have the ever have the possibility of like a combined tour, like the two the two gods of Buzz? Melvin's and my double N. Um, N. Yeah, we've played shows together with them before, um, but not a full tour. Uh, they come tour a lot more uh, intensely than we do. You know, they'll so like more, more, more touring, or they 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 tour a lot. I mean, I don't know what's happening right now. Now that like uh, Dale is recovering from back surgery so yeah. that might well i know buzz is going on in a uh, i think he's going on an acoustic tour in Florida, oh, okay which that's super i'm gonna see if i can catch that because that's really interesting yeah 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 i saw i saw melvin's light which was sort of acoustic like uh, an acoustic tour huh like an acoustic melvin set yeah <laughs> It was, oh, or was it Buzz just doing acoustic stuff? I can't remember. It was a while ago. I mean, either way, that sounds incredible. I love it when when um those kind of bands do acoustic stuff because there's a lot. There's a, I don't know, you guys said that you're a simple rock band, but there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot where um, a lot of bands can do with acoustic stuff that I don't know opens it. But at the same time, it's really nice to just hear the uh, the rocky of it. And speaking of Awesome albums, like we were talking about before. Plastic Eternity, right? That's like oh. an incredible experimental album of yours. And um, do you consider it like the magnum, magnum opus? Like, do you really think it's... Because I know I, we all think it's amazing. But like, what's oh, your... Oh, that's great. Right. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think it's a really good record. It's hard for me to be objective about our own stuff, you know? Like, you don't listen to your own stuff? Uh, I listen to it when I'm trying to relearn something I've forgotten <laughs> uh, or, uh, you know, like right at the time of recording and getting ready to mix stuff, just trying to figure out like, you know, how, you know, what it is that we want to highlight and whatnot. And so how was that creative process with you guys? Like, is it like, I, I was listening to a, um, an interview with Maynard James Keenan from Tool and he was talking about how, everyone fights in the mixing room because everyone's trying to get their instruments louder louder is that kind of the same thing with mud honey where everyone's just trying to get like louder drums or no. guitars no no we kind of i mean that was definitely in the early days that was you know like you're just listening to it with your ego and i think at this point we're all like a lot better at trying to find the balance and kind of find the greater good of the song um instead of just going hey i want to hear more of me i mean you know we're not really into cocaine or anything <laughs> uh, uh great segue yeah i mean you know that that, that, that just seems i mean I don't, I don't know what tools thing is but uh that just it, it doesn't seem like a, a very healthy um i don't know approach uh, and in terms of songwriting, we don't have, have a principal songwriter who tells everyone what to play and what to do. Usually we just, someone will come in with a riff and that'll be the start of something. That's nice. So again, with the balance, that seems like a big point on Mud Honey. And uh, let's, so speaking of, <laughs> speaking of drugs, do you think the, um, do, you, do you think that music has to be drug fueled? to have that kind of stoner feeling? Or do you no. Think, do you think there's a way for it to be like, to get that driving force by being clean? You can do whatever you want with whatever headspace you're in. Doesn't that, uh, yeah, I wouldn't uh, say that like uh, drugs make good music. So, so it's about headspace. Yeah. And so what kind of headspace are you guys in then when you're creating music? Is it like everyone's, at the, at the point of their lives where they're ready to make another album or? 
Um, oh, sorry, what was that again? What kind of headspace am I in? Well, when you guys are ready to um, come together and make another album, right? Or come together and collaborate again. Is there a certain headspace that everyone's in? Or is it just kind of? Uh, it's usually like, you know, after a day of work. <laughs> <laughs> We're just happy not to be at work. <laughs> yeah that's, that's that's too honestly that's too real i don't even have a job yet hopefully i'll get a job soon but but it's it's scary to to be locked into something for the rest of your life but at the same time it feels liberating and so you work at sub pop like you have an yeah, awesome yeah. job no i work at a place where the the environment is really really cool and i work yeah. with great people so that's super helpful um my wife, uh, we have a poster on our uh, fridge, which actually came from uh, my mother-in-law, and we inherited it when she passed. And the poster uh, uh, has like a body with like a clock for a head and a bunch of gears in the background. And it says, if you like school, you will love work. It's like a, a, a like a lifetime of yeah I, I don't remember the full you know but it, but the the funny thing is to me that like uh, my wife's mother was like not really into <laughs> she's taking into the future huh yeah uh, that's great then uh, I'm glad that you have a good relationship with with um, in laws and stuff you know because too many times I'll hear stories of of um you know people are really rude to to other family members no i know that's that's really off topic but it's it's, <laughs> yeah. it's it's great to see the um cordialness or like the I'm, I'm trying to find a fancy word but i don't know what fancy word to use the niceness it's nice to see when people are are beautiful to each other you know well i mean it helps to have a certain amount of empathy and to like you know just I mean, I try not to be completely reactive. Uh, sometimes I am, uh, but well, it's the human condition. Yeah, and even even being aware of it, you know, it's like that's like the first first step. Right. right. I'm 14. I don't even know what I'm talking about this, but uh, uh, <laughs> in in my it's a, it's a good perspective to have. Yeah, in my and in my short years, for sure. And uh, so, what are you listening to right now? I never talked about this in the beginning. But are there any, like, like have you listened to the new Jay Maskis album? I have. What thoughts it's do you have really on good. it? I saw a dinosaur when they were in town not too long ago. Uh, what I'm listening to mostly right now is Girl Trouble, who are a band from Tacoma, Washington, and they're about to do a 40th anniversary show. Uh, they never really went out on tour very much, but, like, if you think of... The Pacific Northwest bands, at least it started in the Pacific Northwest, uh, that are still going, that date back to the 80s. They're probably, them and the Melvins have been around the longest. And then there's us and Pearl Jam. And what do you think about uh, Pearl Jam having those super expensive concert tickets? Like I saw some, it was like $200 for the worst seats in the arena. Uh, I, I don't understand how anyone could afford that or, you know, but obviously they have fans that are willing to pay. I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a good um, way to keep fans, you know? Yeah. They, they no, I mean, I money. remember years ago, like there was like the, the Eagles who had been broken up forever. Like they did a, uh, a, a tour, like a comeback tour, like hell froze over or whatever. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tickets were like a hundred bucks. And I was like, what the hell? And that burst open this whole thing where like, oh, people are willing to pay like a thousand dollars for tickets to see good, good seats to see, I don't know, Taylor Swift or whatever. It's like, it's, but the, it, it's totally crazy. It uh, moves music away from sort of it, it, it it's um 
for me, I, I kind of think of it like the difference between like skateboarding and, and snowboarding. Like skateboarding, you have your skateboard and you can just do it, right? S snowboarding, you you have all the equipment and then every time you go, you have to pay an outrageous amount of money just to get on the mountain. And that's like, uh, like a, a, I don't know, a way to keep poor people away or something. I don't know. It's fucking terrible. You know, it's, 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 like, it's, it's, it's crass and it's ugly and, you know. It's, it's terrible because I've been snowboarding twice in my life only because it's so goddamn expensive to go snowboarding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I grew up skiing, but, you know, I mean, that was a long, long time ago, and tickets were, like, $5. That would be beautiful. But, then, but back then, $5, you could buy, like, 180 hamburgers. <laughs> and those are, like, because I love snowboarding, and I love skateboarding, too. I skateboard sometimes. I, I, anyways, the issue is, like, I hate it because I love snowboarding, and, like, it feels so good. But you have to pay thousands of dollars for, like, two nights. It's like, so, come on. Yeah. I know the mountains don't need the money. And if it was going to charity, if it was going to help make more mountains and, and <laughs> help like make more mountains. Yeah. Help get more, more people on the slopes or maybe get, I don't know, make it better. If it was actually going somewhere. I could understand it. But when you pay so much money to these slopes, you go and you see it, it's trashed. The food is expensive as hell. The people are not that friendly. So it's like, it's pushing away from the sport and same thing with the music it's pushing people away from the music. Like, I have so much respect for the bands like the Melvins because they are not going to overcharge. Dinosaur Jr. is not going to overcharge. And it sucks because, like, I'm going to see Ween on their opening day of their tour, and we spent 70 bucks per ticket. It's insane. And now the only reason I'm going is because my friend gave me a gift card. So, <laughs> so half the tickets are paid. So it's basically 30 bucks for me and my dad, which that's way better. Right, right. But, like, Dude, I, and I know it's not, most of the time, it won't be in the hands of the artist. It's 70 bucks. Who's paying 70 bucks for a general admission show? It's crazy. And it's weird. It's like, it's the same thing with Pearl Jam. Like, you know, these bands that will say, screw that, let's do our own thing. And then, you know, back in the 90s and say, let's do, let's do what we care about. It almost feels like a corporate like a corporate um, parasite. Feels like they get lured in and then they're stuck and it, it sucks. So um, we have six minutes and 40 seconds left. Speaking of corporate, corporate shit, the Zoom won't let me. Zoom. I know, we gotta boycott Zoom. But um, I'm gonna give you a big question and then you, okay. you're gonna be on a time crunch, okay? I'll, tr I'll do my best. You gotta give me three songs, three albums, three whatevers and um you can this is up completely up to your interpretation so some people have done three songs three um philosopher philosophers and then like three favorite books and then some people do a favorite song a favorite movie and a favorite genre so it's, it's whatever the hell you want oh jeez <laughs> i always feel like i'm getting put on the spot um you get the best answers And get ready, because I'm going to write this down. Okay. Uh, uh, favorite Stooges song is Dirt. Oh, yeah, Stooges. Good thing. Um, and I think that might be all I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, movie, Dr. Strangelove. Dr. what? Doctor Strange Love, like a Marvel uh, movie, is that like mm -hmm. Doctor Strange? No, 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 no. It's a, a Cold War. <laughs> oh, like the opposite. The complete. It's opposite. with Peter. Peter Sellers plays three different roles, and it's uh, hilarious and dark. And, that sounds uh, great. That's right up my alley. Huh, um. I don't know if I have another favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are a few of my favorite things. There's two of them. 
How about uh, what's your favorite way to start the day? If I can squeeze in before work, going swimming. Oh, you swim? That's interesting. A, a little bit. You but I like being in like this uh, big rectangle of uh, uh, of something that kind of keeps you buoyant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you're it's in like space. floating in jello, moving through it. Maybe one day we should do that. Maybe we should just like make a shit ton of jello. And then make like we'll make, we'll make people spend eighty dollars on tickets, and you can jump in the Jello. We'll sell that to Ticketmaster, and we'll see what they do with it. How, <laughs> let's do here. Let me let me see through my. Let's see if there's anything else. Uh, importance of comedy and music. That's a question I wrote down maybe five minutes ago. The importance of comedy and music. Yeah, of being lighthearted. And you're at uh, I, I think there's a place for it. I'm not like uh, super into wackiness. Like Weird Al? Well, I think Weird, Weird Al, actually, have you seen the Weird Al documentary or the biopic? I have. It's beautiful. That is a, I love that's, it. That's the only good music biopic there is. For sure. And because it's the only honest one. And Weird Al is like a, he's like the, um, like the Barney of the music industry, but like no one hates him. I mean, he's done. He's not done anything bad. He's a he's a loving guy. And it's great to see. Like he hasn't been, he hasn't been fucked up by corporate greed. He's a normal guy. He still has got his haircut. He wears his, his shirts. He's like, he's the definition of maybe what, what what the '90s bands, or like punk, what like the '80s punk bands, um, sought out. You know, like being true to yourself. Even if you are like a wacky a weird owl, at least you're, you're a weird owl. What I mean, you know, what he's really adept at is uh, writing his own lyrics to other people's music. Yeah, and even his own his own writing is beautiful. Like he is a he's a he's a funnily enough, he's like a, one of the best musicians there is. And it, I don't know, that's like a bucket list. Like me and my old it, friends, it's like the Jean Luc Ponty of accordion players. Oh yeah! Wow, great. What a great, what a great, uh, what figure speech or whatever the hell that is. Yeah, he, I completely agree. He's like the Alan Holdsworth of accordion. <laughs> Alan Holdsworth. Do you listen to Alan Holdsworth? Uh, you, you know, uh, when I was in high school, I was really into uh, Rush, and I remember reading an interview with Alex Lifeson, and he was like, uh, he said his favorite guitar players were. Steve Hackett and Alan Holdsworth. And I had no idea who, where these guys came from. You know, information was a little bit hard to find at that time. Uh, so I just like started looking for Steve Hackett and Alan Holdsworth records in the record stores. Steve Hackett had a couple of solo records. So oh, yeah. I had Steve Hackett records before I had Genesis records. And then um, uh, I finally found like, Alan Holdsworth played on this UK record, the very first UK record. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. What a great record. Um, and but he's from Soft Machine originally, right? Yeah, he is. And uh, speaking of, I got to see Steve Hackett um, when he came to Atlanta, and his manager came up to me and took my record and got it signed for me. Oh, rad! So um, awesome. <laughs> Steve, Steve's a real one. Those tickets were maybe, th uh, I think, the cheapest tickets were thirty bucks. So he's still <laughs> keeping it real. Um, nice. I don't. I don't want to get cut off by Zoom, and it's telling me I have no more time left. So okay, it was, it was a complete honor. You are an awesome dude. Anyone who hasn't listened to Mud Honey, listen to Mud Honey, and um, we gotta see you and Melvin's on tour, and you better come to Atlanta, okay? The double okay. M tour. I'm envisioning it. Double M tour. Right. You're gonna have stacks and stacks of amps. Your background's just gonna be amps, and it's gonna be like, like a spiritual. It's gonna be like um like being on mushrooms, but with only you feeling the music. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely talking. Like on uh, uh, Portobello's. Mm -hmm.